Wake that ass up early in the morning. The Breakfast Club. Morning, everybody. It's DJ Envy, Angela Yee, Charlamagne the Guy. We are the Breakfast Club. We got a special guest in the building. Absolutely. Ricky Lake. The legend. The oh. legend. Good morning. You're too Good morning. kind. Good morning. We nice to see you. you. Oh, well, funny you should mention that. I'm doing a new show where I'm doing a podcast with my old show called Raised by Raised Ricky. Raised by Ricky. Yeah, wow. what do you think? I think that's a great idea. I'm, I just realized what the concept is just now when you said it, because I just thought it was going to be, you know, you doing a podcast, you know, talking about current events, but it, you're reliving the show. Yeah, we're going to go back in time and break down these episodes. Wow. I mean, Because, you know, Lemonada Media is an amazing podcast company. These women are badasses. And they approached me. And I, you know, I've been asked to do a podcast, as everyone has over the years. And I was like, mm, no. We, t- Abby Epstein, my partner, and I. Good morning, Abby. We talked about morning, it. Good morning. My filmmaking partner. I'm so happy she's here. But, no, this concept, something about, you know, first of all, it's a 30, this year's 30 years that I did the pilot of the Ricky Lake Jesus show. Jesus wow. Christ. So I was 20. Three years old when I did the pilot. I'm now 53. So, you know, it was really interesting to me. I think what we were able to do back then, I didn't think of it at the time as groundbreaking, but the issues we were able to cover, Mm -hmm. um, the way we treated gay people, the way we treated mixed race couples, the way we, you know, it was just we covered a lot of bases. Mm -hmm. And I think it'll be really interesting to go back with the lens of now, where we are now. Have we made progress? Have we gone backwards? And we're going to have a co-host that's Gen Z, that's probably, you know, someone who's non-binary, certainly a person of color, Mm -hmm. and who didn't grow up with me, Mm -hmm. and kind of tell the story and bring back old guests, old experts, and I I think it'll be a lot of fun. You know what I love about shows like Ricky Lake, even Donahue back in the day, even early Oprah, y'all sat down with people you had differences with. You sat down with people you may not have agreed with. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, if you do that, they'll call you problematic. I, I don't understand that. Mm -hmm. I don't either. I mean, and that's why I'm glad I don't have the show that I had back then now. Mm -hmm. It just feels like you're walking on eggshells no matter what you do. You're going to piss someone off. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, I just think it's going to be a a cool experiment. I mean, I think we're all nostalgic for that time, the 90s, and uh, I'm I'm up for it. No, I'd love to see you and Arsenio do that. I'd love, to, yeah, I would, I would love to see that. I'd love to see that. Oh, you would, God. You would, no, before, but we, we didn't ask one question. What's that? How are you? I'm amazing. Oh, yeah. I am the best me I have ever been, you know, which is like I did that show and my name was on the rug and mm-hmm. I didn't really have a sense of who I was. And I mm. think in making these documentaries that I've been making with Abby for more than 15 years, mm-hmm. I've really come into a place of like knowing my voice and what I believe in and what I stand for. And I've now, you know, gone dark i lost my partner five years ago to Mm, bipolar and suicide but Mm. i've now five years later met the man of my dreams and i just got married two months ago i'm I'm living my best life thank you so much how are you abby i'm so good (laughs) i'm so happy to be with this woman we just had our double feature premiere last night Mm -hmm. and we watched this movie we made 14 years ago in the same theater that it premiered in at the ifc center business of being born and we just both sat there with my son who's now 15 who was born in the movie wow and Mm -hmm. like we had chills the whole time you know because we were watching this going i can't believe that we made this in 2008 it still holds up it was powerful Uh, it was a powerful from the beginning before you guys met what made you start the ricky lake show you were only 24 years old what said what what made you think this is what i want to do you want to know the honest truth absolutely it was the job that came along Honestly, I had been a guest. I don't. You guys are younger than me, mm-hmm. but um, I Not was a guest. Much. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, I'm 53, and I was. I'm I was. I did. Okay, I did hairspray when I was 18, mm-hmm. and I Letterman. David Letterman was a big fan of John Waters, and so he would have me on over and over again, kind of like Sandra Bernhard back then. And it was from those appearances that they thought of me. They were uh, this guy Garth Ansier was a, a kind of media whiz. He wanted to do a younger show because he looked at Oprah and Donahue, and they were skewing over fifty-five. Mm-hmm. So they wanted to do something to skew towards younger women, primarily women eighteen to thirty-four, eighteen to forty-nine. So they went on a search, and I was one of a hundred women at that time. I went and flirted with three gay guys. <laughs> I didn't know they were gay, but I just, I just brought out my skills, and they gave me the pilot. And I was like so broke at that time. I was living in a pool house in the valley north of Victory. If anybody knows where that is, no one spoke English, and I, you know, I was kind of couldn't get my agent to call me back. And I got this opportunity. I was like, all right, I'll do it for five thousand dollars. I needed my rent paid for a year, and I'll do do it for that. Luckily, we renegotiated, and it turned into this phenomenon. And it wasn't a calculated move. Every step of my career, including the business of being born, is never yeah. coming from a place of like seeing the big picture. Mm-hmm. It's really about, yeah. all right, that sounds good. I could do it. 
Um, so I think I have this confidence in me and also this like naivety, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, it's worked out. So the first it, time it, you, you got $5,000 to do the show? Well, yeah. Yeah, I did. <laughs> but the first season, so then my agent did get involved and they packaged the so show, the of course. the first season was $5,000? No, the pilot. Oh, okay. The, the pilot, pilot okay, was okay. initially, that was my opening bid was I'll do it for $5,000. Mm -hmm. And then the first year, you know, at my salary, I don't remember what it was, but at the end of the first year, the show was such a huge success. This is 1993. Mm -hmm. They gave me a bonus of a half million dollars. Wow. Really? Yes. A lot of money in 93. A lot of That was a, a lot, lot of money, money for Ricky yeah. Lake. Yeah. Like, I was broke. I was, my house was foreclosed at that time. Yeah, I was needing that money. And it was, you know, that show, it was, I mean, it was just my life. Like, I didn't have the concept like I'm 24 years old I don't even know who I am you know mm -hmm. who like, like the audacity to get on that stage and moderate these panels but I think looking back at it I I, I was I was the perfect kind of person for that role because I was a good listener you know mm -hmm. I was very forthcoming about my own you know hardships I'm curious yeah. I'm so fascinated by people I don't judge people and so I think and you're those so are... real you're so real mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. anybody who meets Ricky any of my friends but anyone who meets Ricky in five minutes they go that woman has the biggest heart, and she's just so real. Like, you don't meet a lot of celebrities that are like that anti-celebrity quality. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really what worked on that show. Yeah, the show was a party, you know? It was just like, mm -hmm. you know, the people that came to our show, they waited months and months and months to get tickets back then. And, it, you know, it was always surprising. I mean, it was a little formulaic, I have to admit. Like, I knew, you know, I knew from the names, I could tell, okay, this is a black story. The first <laughs> guests, the first guests were always the most outrageous, mm -hmm. you know, and then we'd have the white story, and then we'd, you know, we'd balance it out. Um, but I feel like we, we did do a lot of good. Like, we, mm -hmm. you know, we, we definitely saw people, and many times at their worst, but I feel like I treated everyone equally. I treated everyone with compassion, and... It was a good time. It you, was, did, you said something earlier that was interesting. You said, um, you know, and it says a lot, right, about what women had to go through because you're obviously talented, but you say you had to flirt with the executives mm. <laughs> to get. I didn't. I don't think it was a prerequisite. It was just okay. my. It was my <laughs> mo. Yeah. But I mean, did, did women feel that way, or was that just? Something? Well, I wasn't even like I was, you know, very like heavy set, and I, you know, wore a big flower hat. Probably. I mean, I didn't have a really a game. I didn't have any yeah, game yeah, back yeah, then. Yeah, yeah. But I knew how to be charming and appealing, and it worked. It worked in my favor. But um. Yeah, that's the only game I know. Mm. I was going to ask, how did you guys meet? Mm. Create this business. How was that? <laughs> so funny. You tell them. Okay. So I was directing a show. Do you remember the show, The Vagina Monologues? Yeah. 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 Do you remember that? That was also like started in the, in the was that late HBO? 90s. No, they, they made an HBO. Yeah. Okay. HBO did okay. a special, but it was a play off Broadway, ran for a really long time. Um, and so originally we had three actresses that would rotate every two weeks. So every two weeks, three celebrities would come in and I would put them into the play. Mm -hmm. And Ricky came in one week. And like I said, she's so real, you know, like most of these celebrities, you know what I mean? I don't really want to get drinks with them after. I just want to do mm -hmm. my job mm -hmm. and go home. And then Ricky and I rode the bus home together and she just had me on the floor like she just had me at hello and so we met and then um i guess this was like years later this was we met in like 99 had... or 2000 i got pregnant with my second son and then yeah. i was wanting a home birth like i i was you know getting educated about my options and so i was telling her and she's like you're crazy you're crazy you're crazy <laughs> and then i got to 9 11 was a huge turning point for me where i was living downtown and i i you know i thought we were going to die i watched the second plane hit the building and i in that moment of, of being on the roof of my building with my four-year-old and I had a two-month-old at the time. I said, I'm leaving, if I get out of this, you know, alive, I'm leaving New York, I'm leaving this job and I'm leaving this man. Wow. And I moved to LA, it took a year and a half, I had to finish my contract. I didn't end up quitting my show per se, but I ended. I didn't renew my contract that back then. And I wanted to start a new life and that's when I started soul searching about what, where I, what I wanted to do, where I could make a difference and we made the business of being born. But you know, mm -hmm. I had her come out. You can't, I said, you got to come out and see my fat house in Brentwood. Yeah, come over and see my new life. Yeah, I like basically stopped at her new house, like on on my way back to LAX, missed my flight because we started talking. Mm -hmm. And I had made one documentary at that point about violence against women, and I I knew how to roughly make a documentary. And she was like, I have this idea for this project. It's about midwifery and home birth. And I was like, this does not sound commercial. This does not sound like a like mm -hmm. a hot seller. I had no idea what a midwife was. 
And then she whipped out her little video camera. My, my nine hour home birth video on my little, you know, camcorder. And I yeah. gave it to her and I said, here, you, I hadn't even watched it. I gave it to her yeah. and gave her a couple of books. And she came back and she goes, I think we can make a documentary. And then the yeah. magic of this film, it took three and a half years to make, is she got pregnant two years into the making of the film. Mm -hmm. And then her story, her dramatic story of her birth is in the, yeah, is so the end of the film. That was intense last night when we were watching it again. And Ricky's there with her new husband, Ross, who's never seen the movie. Mm -hmm. I'm there with my son, who's born in the movie, who's never seen the movie. My ex is sitting in front of me. It was like, and he shot the movie. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was really intense. But yeah, so we both... We both give birth, essentially, in that movie. So it's a really rare kind of documentary where it's a personal piece right. about the filmmakers, and then it's also like a very political piece, and it's still so relevant. What took so long for it to come out? Oh, three and a half years? It oh. Because that's how long they make. No, yeah. this, this one that we just released oh, last night, one. The yeah. Business of, be of Birth Control, took yep. seven years. That's what I'm saying. What took so long? Seven. That's how long they... We started it in 2015. Because 2015... First of all, you guys, nobody wants to give you any money to talk about. <laughs> yeah, that's a fact. <laughs> and especially if you're like, oh, we want to talk about women's health. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah. We want to talk about like how crappy the birth control pill is. Yeah, I don't think I want to fund that. I mean, it's controversial. Um... There's no celebrity in it. And Big Pharma has their hands Ugh. on everything. So for us yeah. to get into sort of mainstream media, there's all this backlash, you know. Yeah, you're Coach not going to get... Coach Jessie's, I know, friend of, the, yeah. of your show, mm -hmm. and she's she's uh, heavily in our film. She's we in the her. movie. We love her. But, like, this message, it's like Netflix, HBO, they're, they're not going to make this movie with us. There's no way. With what we want to say in the business of birth control, there's no way. So, you know, you start in 2015, you do a Kickstarter... You get a little chunk of money, you make a sizzle reel, you know, you just, it's like, and then we did this movie, Weed the People, in 2018, so we had like another movie in the middle of the movie. And that's that about cannabis, had, that's about yeah, cannabis. Yeah, that's about cannabis and children with cancer. And then, um, so yeah, it just, it takes a while, and also because like when you're making these films, these films take so much work, right, but they're also your side hustle in a way. like. Nobody's paying you, you know, at the time. So you're just like working on them when you can. And they're at a time, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're just like passion projects. They are passion but projects, for sure. They always come out at the right time. Like, right. I think the business of birth control releasing now, like, this is the moment for it. Yeah, especially with women's, you know, reproductive rights, yeah. you know, being, being stripped. stripped away right. by these GOP people. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So what is the business of birth control? Mm -hmm. We, well, in the same way, did you ever see the business of being born? No, I haven't. Uh, I urge you to because it's yeah. really, you know, we take a hard look at what birth, you know, the birthing world, the medical system when it comes to birth. And the same thing, we look at the pill, the history of the pill, the racist piece of mm -hmm. it. Did you know that they tested, you tell, they tested the drug, the pill initially on, on black and brown women mm -hmm. in Puerto Rico. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think that at the end of the day, it's sort of like you can equate the business of birth control to, in a way, the opiate epidemic. You know, it's really profits over people. Um, it's it's the way, you know, we know women's bodies have been co-opted and controlled and exploited for years. So like Ricky was saying, we, we the film covers a lot of ground. It's, it's truly mind-blowing. Mm -hmm. I think people sit there for 90 minutes and they're like, I didn't know any of this shit. Like, I literally didn't know anything in your movie. So one thing is we look at some of the products that are out there, like the Nuva Ring that's had a lot, a lot of women die on it and you never hear about any of that you yeah. never hear about any of it because you get gag orders when you accept settlements mm. oh. so when the drug company settles with all these victims they're then not allowed to do any promotion so the stories in our film are the families who they wouldn't didn't settle take, yeah, they didn't, they didn't take money. the money because they want to change the labeling on these products they don't want other girls to die um so we tell that story. And then, like Ricky was saying, you know, we look back in time over the way birth control has been tied into eugenics, the way that it's always been used to, you know, weaponize basically against communities of color, um, how obstetrics was literally founded on slavery in Africa. The pill was tested on women in Puerto Rico and on and on and on. Um, and then we also look at in a positive way, you know, we look at this new generation that does not want to take the pill that their grandmothers took. Mm -hmm. um, they're woke. They're ecological. They don't want to put, you know, endocrine hormones. Disruptors. Yeah, endocrine disruptors in their body. And so if the pharmaceutical companies aren't going to come along with, like, healthier options, they're going to make them up. You know, we're going to invent them. So you look at all these cool femtech entrepreneurs and 
in a way, I think, you know, the younger generation, it's like they're they're kind of a do it yourself generation. They're not going to rely on these big companies. And so, you know, we look at all the innovation that's happening, which mm-hmm. is super cool. Mm-hmm. Did it explore any of uh, Margaret Sanger? Oh, yeah. Okay, okay, okay. Oh, yeah. Okay. And, and then, that happened during the making of the film. It we happened during her. the film, which was interesting. Yeah, so we originally, I remember, like, Gloria Steinem saw an early cut. And, you know, everyone was worried about that Margaret Sanger legacy. Like, oh, you're going to take her down. I think we're really fair to her in the movie. But then at the end of the movie, we, we show an update about how Planned Parenthood in New York City took her name off the clinic. So, you know, that it's not so like they Planned Parenthood finally had to come out mm-hmm. and say, you know, let's be transparent. Like we cannot be identified mm-hmm. with our founder. Mm-hmm. Um, so, again, that's why I think the timing of the movie was so good, because I think having that conversation about Margaret Sanger five years ago wouldn't have happened like we would have gotten a lot of pushback yeah my wife doesn't like birth control that's why i get a vasectomy now because we just had our fourth daughter <gasps> she's you. six months old yeah and it's like yeah Congrats. she refuses to get back on birth control because it makes her sick she hates it yeah it's, it's yeah. awful like all the options are terrible and you go out there and talk to anybody and they will tell you their birth control journey and they'll tell you every product they used and how depressed it made them or how they lost mm-hmm. their sex drive or how they got in fat. my case i mean i had hair loss i don't know if you know i shaved yeah. my yeah, head a couple years ago i was dealing i mean my hair is pretty much it came back but i, I attributed oh, so that was because of the birth control well that's part of it i okay. mean i think it's a lot of yeah. things i was putting extensions in my hair i was coloring my hair i was stressed about my hair i have androgenetic uh, alopecia, which is the you know genetic hair loss over years. Yeah, it was all but of the above, but definitely birth control. If you mess with your hormones, think about it, you know? And it's like what we say in the film is like sometimes now these kids are getting put on 12, 13 years old for acne, for cramps, mm-hmm. you know? Like you'll, you'll see with your daughters, it's like you, you got to make these decisions, right? When you have like a 13-year-old, 14-year-old that's like, oh, but my period cramps are so bad. And then the doctor's saying, well, just put her on the pill. That'll take care of everything. That's how they treat everything. Wow. Mm-hmm. And um, and that's that's not going to cut it. That's not going to cut it for the new generation. So I think it's like, you know, two things. One is there's a lot of things that people are getting put on the pill for that have nothing to do with birth control, right? Mm-hmm. Acne, um, PCOS. fibroids, PCOS, right? So we need actual treatments mm-hmm. for these conditions. We need studies <laughs> yeah. to happen on women. <laughs> studies, yeah. yeah. And then, you know, we need to be more educated about the menstrual cycle so that there's other ways to intervene and relieve cramps or whatever the issues are. Mm -hmm. Because what's happening is these girls are going on at like 12, 13, 14. They're not really, you know, their hormones are not really developing. They're on something that's cut, like basically putting them into menopause at 13. Yikes. And they're not, and they're staying on it. Then Mm -hmm. they stay on it for maybe 10 20 years. I mean, these drugs were not designed or FDA approved to be on for 20 long-term years. Long-term use. Yikes. Did you know that when you're on these drugs, it changes your pheromones? Yes. It changes who you're attracted to. They do this t-shirt test that was out of, what, mm-hmm. Sweden or something? Scotland, yeah. So it's actually your, your, so your pheromones, you know, it's like how you, you can smell out attraction, right? Mm-hmm. So you know how if you, like, have sex with certain people, you like their smell, you mm-hmm. don't like their smell, right? That smell is actually giving your body information about their DNA. It's actually telling you whether you're going to make healthy offspring with that person. Wow. wow. And when you go on these birth control products, it takes that like animal sense offline. So you can't smell anymore. So they say like for women, the line is you're going to be attracted to someone who's more like brother than other. So you're attracted to more maybe kind of feminine men you know, men that aren't, don't have that kind of opposite polarity. Mm -hmm. And um, so you hear this a lot anecdotally, right? That women either go, like are with a partner, decide they need some protection, go on the pill, suddenly they're not attracted anymore. Mm. Or the opposite. Or the opposite. When they go off to family plan, they suddenly are not into their guy. Oh, y'all about to make YouTube conspiracy thing go (laughs) go crazy. (laughs) YouTube conspiracy is about to go crazy. So listen, can it help you, can it make you change your, what gender you like as well? No. Oh, no. Oh, no. Okay. All right, they won't go that crazy. <laughs> I wouldn't say that. <laughs> okay. You talk about your hair condition. So how, how did you get your hair back healthy? So I, you, okay, so I think it's a lot of things. Like I said, I don't stress anymore. I, I mean, when I shaved my head in grand fashion at the turn of 2020, I mean, I did it in a way, like, can you curse on this show? Yeah, sure. Okay, I said, fuck it. Like, I was so done 
with struggling about my hair. It was my deep, dark secret. Every time I looked in the mirror, I could see my scalp, and it just it just drove me crazy. And the extensions were pulling. I'm sure many of your much of your audience knows what that's like. It's just mm-hmm. it's just it was painful, and it was because I was a public figure, and because I'm so outspoken, and honest, and authentic. I this was this piece of myself that I was hiding, and I just decided, all right, I'm gonna rock a bald head. I, you know, I don't know how it's gonna look. My friends were telling me, don't worry, you can do it. You're gonna be able to pull it off. And I just did it and gave up. And then I came into finding this product that I'm now an ambassador of. I've never taken an endorsement in my 30 plus year career. It's called Heart Clinic and it's a shampoo and extract and something about the fermentation. I can't explain it, but it's non-toxic and it's helped my hair to be he- as healthy as it, as it can be. Now, you know where I'm going next. Were you offended mm-hmm. by Chris Rock's joke mm-hmm. towards Jada Pinkett Smith? Mm-hmm. I mean, by I was more offended life. by his actions. It's like, mm-hmm. it's, uh, by, by Will Smith's actions. Okay. I mean, like I used to say on my old show, violence is never the answer. And the fact that it went to that extreme, I mean, nothing, nothing that comes out of anyone's mouth justifies a physical altercation. Mm-hmm. But I also did feel for Jada in that moment because I... I I would hate to be the butt of that joke if someone were, and that was one of my fears when I did shave my head. Like mm-hmm. I, I didn't, I didn't know what the reaction would be, and mm-hmm. I, 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 I couldn't think that far ahead. But I was so scared of people making fun of me or calling me names. So I definitely, it definitely struck a nerve for me because I think women suffering with that condition, mm-hmm. um, it's not funny. What if he but, didn't know? What? Yeah, no, no. I, I think yeah, I mean, there's a lot to the story. I mean, we're all speculating, but I think mm-hmm. there was a history with them and, and the Oscars. Mm-hmm. So I don't know. I mean, I, I, I saw this morning that her, her her reaction to the slap after the slap, she sort of smiled. I mean, I, we don't know. Mm-hmm. But I know for me personally, definitely a joke about a woman's hair loss is not is not funny. Have you, how have you been doing mentally? Because we talk about a lot of the things, right? We talk about your husband that, that took his life and the hair loss and everything that you've been going through. How have you been doing? And how have you been coping? Well, now, I mean, now I'm literally in the happiest place in my entire life, which says a lot because I've been a really happy person. I've had a blessed, you know, abundant life and career. Um, My kids are great. I mean, that's really the start. It's like you're only as happy as your least happy child. And both my kids and my four stepchildren are all great right now. And my my new husband is just a dream. So I, you know, I feel like I've been given a second lease on life. You know, mm-hmm. after losing Christian, I mean, I I I I never thought I could be as low as that. I mean, the, the level of despair. Um, I had to be literally physically picked up off the floor. And I remember. I mean, this was just five years ago. I would force myself. I had a dog, and I would force myself to walk outside at the beach and smile at the sun and find gratitude, find something to be grateful for. And I, you know. There were dark, dark days. I never thought I'd be in a place of peace and happiness. Mm-hmm. And um, I really am. Like I just, like I said when we first started, I, it's like I feel like I'm the best me that I've ever been. I really right. know myself. I really love myself. I've, you know, through this journey of sh- shaving my head, and I mean that was a badass move. And I, 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 I came out of it okay. You know, so like all of it has been a journey. I'm 53, and and I guess when you turn 50, you kind of get a sense of who you who you are, and also you don't care what people think as much. Right. Yeah, I don't really mm-hmm. care what people think of me. I know my side of the street is clean. I'm a good person, and I appreciate every day. So to answer your question, I'm great. How, do, how, <laughs> does, how does one uh, allow themselves to, to, to love again and be loved mm. after something like that? Mm. I've always felt that I've been, like, deserving of love, you know? I think I chose partners um, that either were physically a certain way, so I felt better about myself. I chose partners that needed me, that, so I f- saw my value in that. I, they needed fixing or they needed taken care of. I mean, this is the first time in my entire life, and I've had many, I've been, this is my third marriage, where I'm with someone who's my equal, mm-hmm. who brings as much to the, to, the, to the relationship as I bring. And that, I think, comes down to like self, self-worth and self-love. Was there, was there any guilt? Because I'm sure people will say to you, Oh, five years, that wasn't long, but who are they to say that? Oh, yeah. I, I, that was a long five years. It was a long five years, and I don't care what anybody has to say. Like, I, 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 and I continue to, to honor this, this man that I lost. I mean, he was, he was my greatest teacher to this mm-hmm. day. He's my greatest teacher. Christian Evans mm-hmm. was so special and mm-hmm. so ill. And I didn't even know what bipolar was when, mm, when I got right. with him. I'd never experienced it. I, you know, he told me when we met, he's like, oh, I was diagnosed bipolar. And I was like, oh, yeah, and I'm a control freak. We all have our things. You know, I, <laughs> I didn't understand what a manic episode was. And so, you know, with Kanye, I mean, I, like, I really, I, re- I, just, I just know that the, to be the loved one uh, going through that. And um, 
you know, losing Christian the way I did. I mean, for me, the trauma was the episode, the first episode mm -hmm. versus the suicide, mm -hmm. because seeing your loved one change on a dime and, and become so destructive and, and so like just someone I didn't recognize. Mm -hmm. But I, you know, yeah, I've done a lot of work in these five years. And, um, and I think also with Ross, my, my husband now, I mean, it's like, I deserve him, you know, it's mm -hmm. really like, I, I know my value and I, mm -hmm. I, I, I really just, I called him in, you know, I manifested him and I, you know, just, just, Ooh. I, yeah, I, I relish this time in my life in this relationship. You've lived, you, you've lived all the big pop culture stories of the past 30 days. <laughs> <So> <laughs> yeah. like, 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 like literally. I have, I mean, it's, it's all true. so sort of, it resonates, you know, I mean, the Oscars, like I, you know, I was going on Monday, I did a promotional for this hair company that I've been working with. And it's the night before that that happened with the joke, you know, it's just, yeah, it feels like my life, my life is a movie. It really, it really is. It's so true. You have lived them all, and also, you know, she she speaks about them. Like she's gone to give talks on mm. on mental, mental health, health, and yeah, yes. and I think that that's, um, you know, it's. I think just being a witness to what she went through with Christian, you, you know, that kind of bipolarity, it is so tricky. It is so tricky because it doesn't present as an illness, like. It sometimes presents first as if the person's actually doing great because mm -hmm. you don't realize that they're ascending toward that that mania, mm -hmm. you know, so it's it's you can't intervene. You can't tell somebody, oh, I think you're a little, you know, it's it's it, it was it was an impossible situation. It was like you guys did everything, tried everything, therapy, drugs. I mean, I just that's what's I super frustrating to, to have dealing with the this. resources, to have the money. Ugh. And I tried to save him. I saved him twice and mm -hmm. I couldn't save him a third time. Wow. And, you know, yeah, I, 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 I'm a fixer. You know, mm -hmm. I'm someone that like really does like, like, mm -hmm. you know, create like, you know, mm -hmm. and I couldn't. And it was really, really hard to come to terms with that. I'd love to hear some of those practices you talked about. You know, you, you, I'm big on mental health and mm -hmm. mindfulness. And I heard you say you you manifested you know, Ross, like what are some of the things you do on a daily? I mean, I know on a daily. I was going to mention ayahuasca. I do not do that I, on the daily. I want to. I can't. Yeah. Not, not on a daily, but I can't wait to do it. It's calling me. They say don't oh. do it until it's calling you. It's yeah, calling exactly. Me. It has to be a calling. And the first time I did it, I did it with Christian. And I did it because he was doing it and I didn't want him to do it without me. That is not the reason to do it. It was a horrible <laughs> experience. But I've done it now about 14 times over a period of the last 10 years. And um, what, oh my. What, is, what does it feel like for people that don't know? Well, it's mm. it's a it's awful. <laughs> it's, it's going to hell and back. Really? I mean, it's literally going to the darkest, darkest. I mean, oh my gosh. And every time has been so different. I did it, it back in Ibiza. I did it, did it in Northern California. I did it in Topanga. I've, I've done it all over. And, you know, my, my, mostly my intention, you have to set an intention. And my intention to do it was letting go. And, and, and I did it once after Christian passed, twice after Christian passed away. And you get these messages, you get these downloads mm -hmm. and you, you see God. I mean, you you, you see that. God. It is one time in particular that that I, I was with Christian. I was up in Northern California mm, under the redwoods, and we were outside. And it was during the day. It was the only time I ever did, did it in daylight. And I remember just being on the ground, like praying, bowing, and and I could literally see and feel the Earth's heartbeat in my hands pulsating. Ooh. And it, oh my, you got. I mean, I have just just talking about it brings you back mm -hmm. i mean it's it's medicine they say you do 10 years of therapy in one night of ayahuasca mm -hmm. and i i think that's I remember that's the true. plant that was the time the plant told you let him go yes let you have to go. let him go you have to let him go i mean i've had so, yeah it's been i mean i i'm not called to do it again right now but i certainly mm -hmm. it's it's very powerful medicine i've also done combo mm -hmm. I've done that mm -hmm. twice i've done i mean I, I'm, I'm like a seeker combo is the frog Poison. Oh, right? toad. No, it's not yeah. the five not MAO DMT. It's okay. what they they burn your skin, the, the top layer of your skin, and they put the medicine in, and it it does a scan. It's supposedly be uh, the strongest natural antibiotic, mm -hmm. and uh, it can heal you from so many different ailments. So I've done. I mean, I'm I'm like a seeker. I'm I'm curious, and I I'm always up for growth. So I'm trying to think of the other things I've mm. done. What have I done? Oh, Burning Man. I, I started What's going to Burning Man. What's Burning Man? <laughs> you do? I don't know what Burning Man is. But you're, you're just Burning Man, every, Burning Man feels like white freak Nick. It's, it is for everyone. What is Burning Man? It is, Burning Man is a, is it, I, it's a I, festival I can't say a desert. festival. It is not a festival. It is a city Community. that takes place over a week. 
You have never heard of Burning Man? I have. All my friends, all my like, uh, I'm going to go to Burning Man. Best place in the world. I, I'm <laughs> going. I'm bringing. You heard of Burning Man? It, you know heard of Burning Man? Oh, my, oh my goodness. goodness. You need to Google it, my friend. It's, it's Like Bob Pittman, all of them go yeah, every yeah, year. Yeah, I, like, I know yeah. Bob yeah. and Veronique. And yeah, I, I mean, it's, it's, it's. It's a place where you go and you are in that moment. You are present. You are free. Mm -hmm. You engage with people. It's a, it's a city. There's mm -hmm. no exchange of currency or anything. You bring gifts, but you give gifts, mm -hmm. um, and you don't do it for anything other than giving. Mm -hmm. You're, you know, it's people are are at their highest vibe at Burning Man. Well, it's, a, it's a place where they call drugs medicines. That's all you need to know. Uh, <laughs> but you don't have that's, that's to do drugs. House. You do, you do <laughs> not. <laughs> they have AA meetings on the playa. You do not have I'm to do kidding, anything yeah. you don't want to do. But it's like magic happens on the playa. I don't, I don't know. I guess I'm, I'm, I'm sounding too No, I'm going to go one day. My, my, my homie Andrew Schultz goes all the time. He was like, you got to call me to Burning Man one year. <laughs> I'm going to go on you. Yeah. If you're called to do it, I, I urge you to go. I haven't been called I'll to see do it. I'll see you on Playa. Yeah. I've been called to do ayahuasca, but not burning me. Uh, let me just tell you, the Playa is a lot more fun. Yeah. <laughs> what is Playa? Playa is a plant-based Playa, Texas No, the Playa is for Burning Man. They call it. That's oh. the, the desert. Mm -hmm. yeah, the, the land. Yeah. Now, you did 12 seasons of the Ricky Lake. 11. 11 seasons. Oh, well, 11, and then I went back and did a new version of the show. Yes. I, that only ran for one year, but I, I won the Emmy that year. And you said you walked away from it? I did the first show. I just okay. didn't renew. Yeah, I mean, it had kind of run its course. 9/11 had happened. I just I wanted to get out of New York. I was going through a divorce. I mean, it just it just kind of fell apart. I mean, it, you know, Maury just ended his show. I mean, I feel like I could have had a run like that. No, I, not I, your I'm personality. No, 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 no. I love Maury, but I, I, yeah, 11 years was enough for the first show. The second show, I wanted to do more of a Donahue type show. Mm -hmm. That was my my concept. I wanted to be the elevated content, more provocative and thought provoking, and it didn't turn out to be that. What was the difference between the first run and the second run? Because like you say, you want you want to end. One was the successful. Run. <laughs> I don't know <laughs> the first one. I mean, I think the timing of the first one and being in New York at that time was magic. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. the second one. I was in bed with the wrong company, I think. The, the executive that was in charge of my production. We had different visions. You know, he wanted a different mm -hmm. type of show than I wanted to do. And I, you know, it goes back to making the business of being born with Abby. I kind of have a sense of who I am in right. a way that I didn't back then. And, uh, yeah, so it was just, you know, in bed with you the wrong You did person. some good shows, though. You really did. We did. We did. Season. I actually did a show on suicide, which is so interesting because I didn't have I didn't have a history like I didn't know that mm -hmm. at the time but I was called to do it and mm -hmm. I fought so hard he said it was never going to rate it was never going to and I felt like we needed to do it and and it was one of the shows I'm, I'm really mm -hmm. proud of wow. yeah. how, 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 how difficult is it for any person to have a successful daytime talk show oh my god I think it's near impossible I mean in the time that I did my show 11 years and we used to go to the Natby convention every year and there'd be you know, a dozen, half a dozen new shows come and go, and they, you know, they mm -hmm. last for, you know, not very long. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's a rare talent. Like, it's like, yeah. I don't think it's something that was taught to me. I think it was like yeah. a natural fit, you know, for me. But um, it's, a, it's a unique relationship, I think, that you have with the world. More than being an actor on a TV show, I feel like because Ricky was in everybody's living room and people ran home from school at 3 o'clock every day to watch Ricky Lake, watch Ricky Lake, like literally... You know, I can see just from traveling the world with her, like we'll be in some hotel lobby in Australia and like, you know, the, like 10 gay men will come up to her like sobbing, you know, and say, oh, my God, you you validated us and you don't know what you meant. And, you know, I, and I think that they have a different relationship with her just because the nature of that show, it's mm -hmm. like it's like she was the perspective of the audience. You know what I mean? Like wow. she was she was sort of your lens into this like world of, of madness. So it's it's interesting to see. I've never really seen um, I've never really seen anybody where it's kind of like her fans appreciate her in a way. Like yesterday, we're walking down the street and people are screaming her name down the street in New York. That's Ricky Lake. I saw you on Wendy Williams this morning. Hi, Ricky. Hi, Ricky. Like it just, she just feels mm -hmm. approachable, mm -hmm. more approachable in that way because I think we lose sense of how many people grew up on her. Like it was one of the original Absolutely. formats. And I think the 90s, they, celebrity actually meant something in the yes. 90s. Yes, mm. yes. It doesn't, yes. Well, anybody, yeah. seems like a celebrity you can lick, a, yes. you can lick the bottom of a toad's foot now and be a TikTok star, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. celebrity yeah. meant something in yes. the 90s. And it feels like everyone, or a lot of people have an agenda. Like, mm -hmm. it's like, it's whether yeah. sell a product or mm -hmm. push some, you know, 
And I guess in a way we are pushing our, but our thing is to help women. You know, oh, our, documentary. Right. our documentary. Our documentary. Our, our big... It's like, it's, yeah, <laughs> we, you know. But yeah, it, celebrity has changed. I agree. And and just the tone that like like, I don't know how you guys do it. I don't know if you ever like second guess what you're about to say for fear of like like backlash or something. But I feel like I was able to say. You know, I, I didn't have to, like, censor myself before like, I say it. Canceled. You know? yeah. yeah, we've been canceled a million times. We've, I mean, we've been doing it for 12 years. So yeah. it's like things have changed over the but past But has it years. shifted in these 12 <laughs> oh, yeah, years? 100%. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. So it's things that they try to go back and cancel us for. But yeah. when we <laughs> said it back ago. then, it was <laughs> yeah. nothing, right, you know? Right, right, right. So it's just, that's the weirdest part to me. Yeah. Yeah. Because nobody wants to have the conversation about how culture shifted. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. It's kind of hard to hold people accountable for things they said in public forums. 10 years ago, 15 years ago, culture no, shifted. Exactly. Right. And I, I felt like that last night when we watched both our movies back to back, you know, and we were watching this movie we made 14 years ago. And I, I'm a little nervous watching it, you know, just for mm-hmm. that reason, because you're sitting there like, oh, do we have enough people of color in the movie? Oh, God, we just said something about Britney Spears in the movie. You know, you know mm-hmm. things that like today might not fly. Mm-hmm. You know? I was going to ask, we always talk about the Mount Rushmore of things, Mount Rushmore, Mount Rushmore of comedians. Mm. What's your Mount Rushmore of talk show hosts? <laughs> okay, Oprah, for sure. Oprah. Donahue. I loved Donahue mm-hmm. back in the day. Mm-hmm. Uh, I loved Arsenio. Let's... I watched him every oh, night. Oh, can we do late night, too? We can talk oh, late night? Oh, sorry. Let's keep it daytime. Oh, he daytime. did. Day- okay, yeah. daytime. Let me think. Oh, my God, throw some names at me, and I'll tell you what I think of them. Um, Oprah Donahue was a good start. You yeah, got two, yeah, yeah, two yeah, more. yeah. <laughs> I mean, Sally, 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 Jesse Sally. Raphael. Sally. Oh, wow. Um, yeah. I, oh, Montel. Montel was a good guy too. Montel. Just did yeah. that show with him. Yeah, remember? yeah. I mean, there's more. There's more, but I'm like, there were so many. Come on. You just was... did that reunion on Tamron Hall. Who was there? Oh, that was Rolando was there and Montel was there. Mm-hmm. Rolando, yeah, when Tamron, when Tamron was up here like last week and she said your name and Rolanda and I was like, Rolanda. I mean, you know, of course, I, did, I just ne- I didn't think of Rolanda. I hadn't heard that name in a while. I was like, oh, Rolanda. shit, Rolanda. Uh-huh. I mean, Tempest Bledsoe had a show. Mm-hmm. Carney Wilson had a show. I mean, That's right. Yeah, everyone Were those had a successful? Show. No, I don't think so. Oh. I think they only ran for Queen a year. Latifah. She had a show too. Yeah. Queen Latifah. Uh, yep, yep, yep. I mean, I yesterday I went and did the Wendy Williams show without Wendy Williams, but it was in my old studio. Oh wow! So mm-hmm. like, yeah. I hadn't been back there in like fifteen years, sixteen years, something like that. I think that was Montel's old studio too, right? Yeah, Mon- uh, Montel Maury was there too. Oh, it's okay. uh, the Twenty Sixth Street Studios, but yeah, it's all just like it just feels like these chapters in my life. And now with this new podcast I'm going to do, I get to go back and right. I. I think it'll be good. Yeah, I wonder with the Raised by Ricky podcast, what did it make you miss most about doing the Ricky Lake show? The money. <laughs> <laughs> the money. So it real. was I mean, it was funny money. I didn't even like like getting a Bonus of a half a million dollars. Come on. <laughs> Come on. That's and like the budget of our entire documentary. <laughs> it was just, <laughs> it was crazy. Were you smart? Were you smart with your money or did you? I'm okay. Yes. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm just fine. Thank you. What's but the believe me. Thing you like, crypto. Crypto. <laughs> crypto. <laughs> but that's not crazy. I don't I'm think kidding. that's crazy at all. I got crazy. in I, relatively early, 2017. Oh, you got in early, early. So yeah. you're doing super well. My mama went big. <laughs> uh, you know, my guy calls me his, you know, uh, uh, Bitcoin wife. You know, <laughs> <laughs> counting my Bitcoin. No, um, like a nine cow. It, it's a, it's a. My guy was an is, is was an ex devout Mormon. So he brings up these these <laughs> Mormon. Anyway, anyway, it's uh, yeah. you did well. I, <laughs> I did okay. okay. I did not do like like Oprah. Oh, I love Rosie O'Donnell too. Rosie's Rosie. a great, mm-hmm. great, great friend of mine and a great talk show host. Um, yeah, I don't have like the money that that these other people have, but I'm also <laughs> I saw Jim Carrey did an interview yesterday. He's retiring. He's like, and he said he has enough, and that's how I feel. I I, I don't come from a place of the work I do is not about the money I make now. It's really about putting out good work. That's good. Mm. Well, mm-hmm. We appreciate you guys for joining us. Well, Thank you so much. Well, I do want to ask one more question. What's well, that? Two more. Do talk show hosts reach out to you to get tips? No. And if, and, they and, did. I'll tell you, Rosie and Ellen both called me before mm, they went and did mm. their shows because they wanted to know what the schedule was like, what how it worked. Um, not late, like no, not mm. not of late. I've been off the air doing. I haven't done my show in so long, but but um, I feel like I I do have some good pointers. Mm-hmm. And I would say the main thing is to be a good listener. That's you know, I think that's what I was best at is reacting to what I was seeing you know I didn't wear an IFB Mm -hmm. and that's something they fought me on every year they just wanted you know the control room and the producers wanted to have Mm -hmm. access to me and I didn't want anyone ever putting anything in my mouth you know so I would have cue cards if they needed me 
but I refused to have an IFB. So I just I just love that. Yes, that show back then. I didn't really know who I was, but um, but I was in the moment and present and tried to be kind and tried to have some fun and do some good. I got one more question. Take a sip of water. Yeah. Just in case. <laughs> How does Ricky Lake want to be remembered? Oh my goodness. Um, has a good time. <laughs> I'm a good time. <laughs> <laughs> I <laughs> am. <laughs> when I. <laughs> That's what you want on the tombstone. Yeah, Ricky I mean, Lake, well, she was a good. Time. I want you know. I want my legacy. Like I, it, it. It makes me happiest when people recognize me and know my work from the work I do with Abby, the business gotcha. of being born. These right. documentaries, I believe, are changing the world, making the world a better place. And they're the most personal projects, and they take a lot of work, a lot of effort. And I'm really proud of you them. You have shifted some culture. Yes, Absolutely. we have. Absolutely. We have. We have. Thank you guys for joining thank us. You so Abby, thank, thank you so much. Abby, thank you so much. Where, where can the documentaries be seen? Yeah. Yes, we're streaming. It, you can pre order now at thebusinessofbirthcontrol.com. We're self-releasing it, so okay. we don't have a big studio behind us. You just go to the business of birthcontrol.com and it's going to be streaming April 8th. All right. And the Ricky Lake Raised by Ricky po- podcast? Starting October 2022. Available everywhere you listen to podcasts. Yep. Okay. Exactly. All righty. Well, thank it's the you. Breakfast Club. Thank you, Ricky Lake. Thank you, Abby. Oh, thank you, Such guys. Such a pleasure. 